All right, good evening, everybody. I see I get to stay next to uh, Matt's wonderful hat here. Um, so welcome everyone to the fall Kelly Tucky Endowed Lecture in Historic Preservation. My name's Andrew Johnston. I'm the director of the UVA program in Historic Preservation. This evening, we're very pleased to welcome Matt Reeves, Director of Archaeology and Landscape Preservation at the Montpelier Foundation. This is the second time we've welcomed Matt to this lecture series. A few years ago, he did a joint presentation with Luke Pecoraro, who was then archaeologist at Mount Vernon. This fall is an excellent time to welcome back Matt um, to present and discuss work ongoing at Montpelier. A collaborator of Matt's from the UVA Library Scholars Lab, Will Rourke, will introduce Matt this evening. There will also be a reception down the hall or around the corner following the talk tonight, so please all come to that. I wish to thank the Kelly Tucky Endowment, the UVA Scholars Lab, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities, and the Interdisciplinary Archaeology Program at UVA. So, Will Rourke. Hey, everyone. I'm Will Rourke, and I'm the 3D Technology Specialist with the uh, UVA Libraries Scholars Lab. And before I say anything, I just want to say, uh, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, I want to acknowledge and recognize that we are on Monacan land uh, here at UVA. Um, so uh, I also want to echo the thanks uh, for everyone who helped uh, collaborate to put this together. Um, this was uh, a few weeks in the making. Um, I started working with Matt uh, back in 2015 to assist uh, 3D documentation of the really cool things that are going on out there in Montpelier. Um, and every time Matt would call me up uh, or email me, I knew it was going to be something really cool for me and the students to go out there and, and engage with, uh, whether it was um, – uh, something they'd uncovered at the Temple Ice House or some of the excavations out in the South Yard or any of the other really great, cool features you're going to see Matt talk about uh, today. And every time I go out there, he would say, look at this, Will. Look at what we've done in GIS. We've mapped all this stuff out. And every time I would go out there, there would be more and more 3D things going on and more and more uh, – rich um, media and asset type things going on. So, so you guys are in for a really great presentation. Um, and I'm just really excited for everyone here to see what Matt has to present today. So uh, I can say I told you so that this was going to be cool. Um, before I get going, uh, before Matt gets going, I just want to read some things about Matt so you can see where he's coming from. Uh, Matthew Reeves is the Director of Archaeology at James Madison's Montpelier in Orange, Virginia. Uh, his specialty is sites of the African diaspora, uh, including plantation and freedman period sites and Civil War. In his 20 years at Montpelier, uh, Reeves has developed a strong public archaeology program known for its citizen science approach to research. At the heart of this program is community-based research with a heavy focus on investing descendant communities in the research and interpretation process and governance of cultural institutions. He has also led the archaeological discipline in devising new ways to engage metal detector hobbyists in archaeological survey through his department's work locating the living and work sites of the enslaved community across the 2,700-acre uh, Montpelier property. Uh, these new site discoveries hold the future uh, for Montpelier, continuing to tell the story of the enslaved community. Matt has already uh, had a, a career-long interest in the graphical data analysis, exploratory data analysis. Matt has lived in Orange since 2000, where he raised his children and has a keen interest in carpentry and home restoration. So here we go. Here is Matt Reeves. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Will. Hope I can live up to your introduction well. So, but um, yeah, when Will asked me to uh, come and speak to you all today about what we're doing at GIS, I was really honored. I, I um, you know, we are with 
With the work we're doing in GIS, we've got a close connection with the architectural community, and to share these ideas with you all uh, is just a, just a real thrill. Um, part of uh, what uh, we're going to be, or what I was wanted to present tonight, is a bit of the the meta meta approach that we're taking with GIS. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I usually like all the talks I've given for the past 25 years have been through PowerPoint, and so it's a guidepost kind of uh, software. What I'm doing tonight is using, giving you basically a guided tour of our, G our GIS maps and how we're using GIS to make the invisible visible at Montpelier. And with the with the uh, uh, you know the, this um, this process of making the invisible visible, I'm, I'm talking about this on two different levels. One is on the level of a of a, a social scientist with the humanities, and this is what you, you might expect. And it is, it is very appropriate with this being uh, Indigenous Peoples Day to acknowledge that you know one of the first groups that was rendered invisible by the occupiers of that time, th some 300 years ago at Montpelier, were the Manahoac. And today, they, uh, the Manahoac are represented by the Monacan uh, Nation. And uh, some 20 years after. 1720, the group that had the really was dominant in terms of forming these landscapes at Montpelier were enslaved Africans, and by that time, in, in, enslaved African Americans, enslaved Americans, and so this is one thing that we're have a heavy have a heavy commitment with, especially with the Montpelier Descendant Committee, in terms of representing at Montpelier, and then also representing through GIS, and we feel like, and we're, we're looking for ways to make GIS into a tool that really effectively does this. The other level of making the invisible visible is through uh, the, the meta level of data. You know, being a data scientist, you know, we use the archeology, span the surveys we do, the excavations, the architectural investigations to restore the landscape back to its early 19th century appearance. And oftentimes when this happens at homes like Montpelier, the data that went into that disappear. And this is something that is a real danger in terms of preserving sites, preserving data. And it's something that GIS is really efficient at, is you know, making the data that goes behind these, these kind of investigations visible. And what I mean by visible is both accessible, because if data isn't accessible, if you have data in a box somewhere and the building burns down, what was the point of the investigations? Or if you have it on a server and no one can get to it. All the data that I'm going to be presenting tonight isn't on a hard drive somewhere. It's not on my jump drive. It's on the World Wide Web, which is you know just amazing. You couldn't do this five years ago with the presentation that we're going to be going over tonight. So the other part of making that data visible and accessible is also making it relevant. And that's something we really struggle with as you know, archaeologists, as architectural historians, is how to reach that, those constituent bases of you know, not just our own profession, but the public in general, descendants. And that's something I want to want to touch on a bit, uh, bit tonight. So what I'm going to do is you know, start this uh, guided tour of, the, of Montpelier. And I want to give a little bit of background, um, especially in regards to making the, visible, uh, 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 the invisible visible. And, uh, what this um, really gets at is the importance of the material record at Montpelier, the built, the, w what's actually in the ground, in the physical record. And for this, what, um, uh, what I want to do is show you, in terms of the 2,750 uh, 2, acres of Montpelier, that's denoted by the, the, uh, the brown outline right here. What's in this uh, shaded outline right here is the property that was owned by the Madison family in the 18th and early 19th century. So today, we've got about three quarters of the original plantation in lands that are owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Now, beginning, the, the Montpelier Plantation was in existence from the 1720s up until 1844, when Dolly Madison sold the property. And it was really the, the, the last 20 years of uh, Madison ownership is what really led to the destruction of a, of a, a number of records that other, other uh, plantation communities can rely on to some, to some extent. Um, in 1836, Madison passes away. Within about uh, six years, Dolly Madison sells the property 
And when she sells the property, not only does she sell the land and the, the, the buildings, everything that's associated with it, she sells the most valuable part of the property cash-wise, which was the enslaved community. And when, that, when the community was sold, it was it, within a period of 10 years, over 120 individuals were, were sold. Most of those families were broken up, if not all. They were sold to the Deep South. And what resulted from that is a loss in oral history. With, with a breakup of families, the ability to pass on oral history is, is, uh, um, is significantly diminished. And so there's all, all, that, all that, that intellectual knowledge that the enslaved community held was lost for, for all time in many ways in, that, in the area of oral history. Second thing that happened was that um, by the time you get to uh, 1854, uh, Montpelier sold in 1844. By 1854, uh, all of the family records are at her, uh, her, her son's house by, by her first marriage. This is John, James Madison's stepson, John Payne Dodd's house outside of Gordonsville. And while, when, all of, when he passes away in 1854, all of Madison's, Madison's nieces and nephews go to, um, to Dodd's birth, where all these records are, found two rooms full of documents decide there's too much scandal associated with Uncle Jimmy, the former president, take all these records out to the backyard and burn them. So with that go all the records that would be associated with the, the garden books, the plantation books, everything that places like Monticello have to show where the fields are, what kind of production was happening, basically the records of what the enslaved community, how they produce the wealth for the Madison family. And whether or not this, you know, what the intention was behind this, what resulted from this was the, the, a destruction of the record of what the economic contributions were that enslaved Americans made at Montpelier. And during the same time, what occurs um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the core of the plantation, so getting into this map right here, uh, that Route 20 is, runs along right here. Um, the, the main house is right in the middle of the property. And when you look at this time slider right here, and you get to the period of around, you know, this is uh, around 1841, you've all the buildings that are in yellow are what were present during the 1820s, 1840s period. By the time you get to about 1860, all, the only buildings that are surviving are the main house and the temple in red here. So by the time you get to the Civil War, all of the the surrounding outbuildings around Montpelier are gone, and the main house uh, remains uh, in its in its uh, in its core. And this is the uh, as we've restored it uh, today. Um, bring this down here. We're, we're, we've restored it to its 1820s appearance. And what occurs at that time is the um, the the by the 1850s, there's a new farm complex built to the east of the main house. And this is where uh, most of the late 19th and early 20th century disturbance happens. And so for this entire area through here, where we, if you step back to the 1820s, there is a massive farm complex in this area that appeared something like this with this, this uh, 3D rendering we've got right here. All this complex in here is abandoned by the 18, 1840s. And what we get in terms of a preserved archeological record with Dolly Madison selling the, uh, the, the, the enslaved community by 1844, you go from around 120 enslaved farmers at Montpelier and workers down to about 25. And then when you get into the 19th century and the post-emancipation era, what happens at Montpelier is the majority of the fields are abandoned. And what at one time was about um, uh, the, tw the 2,700 acres that we have today um, uh, where there was about 400 acres of woods. By the time you get to the um, late 19th century, that uh, 2,700 uh, acre landmass has about 1,800 acres of woods. So you've got this incredible preservation of sites at Montpelier in the it, through the 19th century. 20th century, what happens at Montpelier is the DuPont family buys Montpelier. And then when they buy Montpelier in 1901, what they began to use Montpelier for is more of a, uh, uh, almost more like a, a hobby farm. They, they employ an incredible number of workers, 
but they don't clear the land for agriculture. They basically make it into a hobby farm where there's uh, agricultural buildings that continue to be built in this 1850s complex to the east of the main house, which means that the area uh, where the, the Madison Farm complex was remains undisturbed. In fact, in the, by the mid uh, by the mid 1920s, there's a uh, pool cabana complex that's built in this area that is uh, one of the recreational areas of the Dupont family. And what was formerly a farm area and work area becomes pasture land. So you get all through the 20th century, you get this incredible preservation. And when we began the restoration work at Montpelier in the early uh, 2000 aughts, what we began to, to discover it through the archaeology is just how well preserved the landscape was. For example, when we did excavations in the south yard, what we discovered is when we went down about six inches, you're at this early 19th century surface that's impeccably preserved, where you can, there's an, we were finding enough information from the archaeology to be able to, 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 to justify doing complete reconstructions of the slave quarters in this area, and I'll get to that in a second. What we also found, in the, and this is all in the visitor core, that in areas be below where we built the the, uh, the visitor center right here is we were finding started to find buildings that were related to the farm complex, such as this threshing barn right here, the archaeological remains of a threshing barn. So what we started to gather about the archaeology at Montpelier is this 2,650 2, acre landmass was incredibly well preserved. And what we started to do, because being a young organization, Montpelier Foundation was only began in 2000, there's no endowment, the board's always looking for ways to make money. And one of the, one, one of the ways they started looking, making money was doing timber cutting, do it, not doing clear cutting, but selective cutting of timbers. And this is what inspired us to start doing metal detector surveys where we were looking for Madison era sites in woodlots. And you can guess where the woodlots are, right here where we started on Chicken Mountain and in the, uh, the East Woods. And what we discovered with these, with these, these metal detect detect detector maps, this is before we started using GIS, we were plotting these by hand in an AutoCAD. What they do is show densities of metal detector hits. And if I put on, let's see, the legend right here, go down to where the total hits are, Green areas are lower amounts of hits. When you get into the, the yellows and the reds, these are high densities. And where you've got these, these higher spots, these are where you've got everything from uh, barns that we had located through these metal detector surveys, like th this tobacco barn that we located uh, through the metal detector survey. This is the shot of the survey going on. And then also slave quarters, other buildings, but this was all done on a, on a spot basis. When you look at the areas that are in green here and the area of the historic core that we've done intensive metal detector survey on, this is but uh, probably about a fifth of the total land mass. And what we were, what we were having trouble as cultural resource managers you know, presenting to the board is a comprehensive image of how this land, you know, what resources were here and why it needed to be protected. And so what we were able to do um, in uh, the uh, 2018, this is about the time we started using um, uh, GIS, is we were able to fly LIDAR all across the property. And th this LIDAR that we flew, the only way to get hill shade analysis done is through GIS. And what, uh, how many of you all know what LIDAR is? Have you heard about it? So a good many, but LIDAR, what it produces is these absolutely amazing high resolution terrain maps where when you start looking at, you know, what is woods today, you start seeing all these lines on the landscape and it's everything from the edges of, uh, of fields like right here, actually down to the last set of plow furrows that were turned in, this, in, the, in these agricultural fields in the 1850s. And then when this area becomes wooded by, you know, within, uh, you know, five or 10 years after the Civil War, all this, this, these very delicate landscape features are preserved. And what we're able to show the board with this is, look, you know, we've got features dating to the 19th century all across this area. And when you do a map showing all of this, uh, where, where all this LIDAR data is in terms of lines, what you, yeah, here we go. Well, this, this is a map that uh, one of our staff did who was getting his master's in GIS at the time. He recorded over 1,200 uh, LIDAR features all across the landscape that we could, through other documentation, could show dated to at least the early 19th century. 
And with this, what we're able to show is the landscape has the record of the actions of the enslaved community, the enslaved Americans, their actions, what, what they produced in the labor and knowledge they had of this land for over 100 years. And because of this, when, when we started talking with the descendant community about this, what they started to refer the landscape as is, a, as, a, is as a memory device. That with the landscape, with the archaeology, and in many ways with the architecture, what they were able to do is recover their ancestors' memory that was lost through the sale of their, their ancestors' families and then also through the destruction of the documentary records. The proof of what their ancestors did was in the landscape. And so this is one of the first real successes we had with the GIS. You know, it showed that, you know, that these invisible actions were literally made visible and were mind-blowing for the board. And after this, there was never one ounce of talk of doing any kind of selective cutting of the timbers. And we'll get into that in a second because there's a whole line of, of, uh, of information you can discover from those trees that are out there on the landscape. So with, with this, um, what, we, you know, what I want to do is shift gears a little bit because what, um, what I, what I want to talk about is how we've been using, you know, how we've been interpreting these spaces to the public. Because in, what I want to do is after talking about how we interpret these spaces to the public, to the visiting public, to Montpelier, what I want to get into is how we use these virtual worlds through data both for making the, the invisible communities who are, who are denied their past visible to uh, many different constituencies, but then also use GIS to make the data visible to scientists like you know, folks that are interested in history and also used for, uh, for preservation. So with, with the, the discoveries that we started to um, uh, started, started you know, making some 20 years ago using archaeology, especially within the historic core, one of the ways that we, uh, you know, traditionally, this is used all across, uh, all, all across historic properties, in terms of interpreting these spaces that are no longer visible to the, to the public, you know, when you're dealing with a site such as the farm complex at Montpelier where you've got this field that's below the visitor center, the mansion's up in this direction right here, where people park their cars here, they see this open field that doesn't look like there is anything there. What we you know, tend to do is produce landscape signs with the, this, these kind of drawings or 3D renderings. So you can have a comparison. Here's the present day. This is what, uh, what this area would have looked like uh, back in the 1820s. This is a 3D uh, rendering of what this, this landscape would have looked like in 1820 when it was a farm complex. Where the present day visitor center is, there's a stable. Where the parking lots are, there was um, a, uh, um, an area for, uh, for livestock. And then this major uh, farm complex down in this area. Now, when you look at what is represented on the landscape today, the only sites that are represented in terms of ghosting are these three uh, uh, homes for the en enslaved families who are working here in amongst this area. All the rest of this is not, is, is not visible. And so representing this through signage we found is, is pretty ineffective. I mean, visitors have to go be, use their, use it, create in their mind's eye what this space would have looked like. Other areas, what we've, um, what we've done uh, with, with ghosting, it's provided the jump that we need to do reconstructions. And this is the case, for example, in the south yard of Montpelier. So in the south yard, before any kind of 3D renderings, one of the things that we did was to um, uh, begin the archaeology on this space. And when we did enough archaeology where we knew these buildings were, we built these ghosted buildings in the south yard. And this gave visitors enough information to understand there were buildings here. And then also it, it really made our one fantasy come true that some visitor would come here, ask about these odd-looking buildings that are out there, assume that there are the, uh, the homes and working spaces of the enslaved community, and ask why in the world we don't build, rebuild them. And we talk about the amount of archaeology that needs to happen and that, you know, Restoration grade architecture today is about $500 a square foot, and they'd say, hush up, just how many zeros on the check? And this is what happened with David Rubenstein when he came to visit. He uh, gave us a gift to reconstruct this area. 
So the reconstruction of this area, what we've been able to do is represent these spaces and work with the descendant community on a set of exhibits that really um, uh, gets into the um, into the um, uh, the wh how how these spaces what they represented to the to the enslaved community. Now. When you look at this space, though, and what we've discovered with the archaeology, what you begin to realize is that this space is was a very complicated space. And if we get back to this time slider here and you look at what happened, you know, what this space looked like around 1840, here's the South Yard here with these buildings being present in, in, in yellow. If you go back in time, though, what you can see, though, is that by the time you get back to the 1790s, what buildings are here are more dependencies that are in the front, and the main house was quite a bit smaller, and this landscape appeared something like this. The south yard was not there. You've got these flanking dependencies in front of the house. You've got this 18th century building that's quite a bit smaller because the additions are added onto the house in the 1790s and the 18 teens. And then it becomes a question of, you know, how you begin to, um, to, to really represent this uh, either with ghosting or 3D imagery, and, and how have these um, have these sites be represented? And it also gets into you know if we're restoring the space to a 19th to its 19th century appearance, what do you do with these 18th century buildings that are present in the archaeological record? How do you make sure that the integrity of those sites are preserved? And this, you know, just isn't present in the uh, around the main house. This is all the way through, you know, into the area of the uh, th this home farm as well. If you look at this time slider going back to uh, the 1760s, you notice in this field here, there's nothing here. There's no buildings. What's present is these three buildings here, which in the 18 1760s was the original farm complex called Mount Pleasant. And so when you look at the, you know, how these sites are being represented, you know, there, there's, a, there's a limitation with reconstructions, but also this gets into, you know, what we're, um, what we're doing in terms of ensuring that these sites that are invisible because we're not rebuilding them are visible in terms of making sure that we manage these properties. I mean, you've got a visitor center that's right here. You've got a septic field that's right here. Sites that aren't, even if we're rebuilt all this area, there's 18th century sites in here that we're not going to represent in the landscape, but that we need to have access to in terms of the data of them being there. And so this is where, when you with, with GIS, what you can begin to do is represent these spaces in terms of data in a very different way. So in, on these renderings right here, when you uh, start to, to, you know, to look at these areas, for example, this right here is the overseer's house, shows up on an insurance plat. We've done excavations on this area with the, these units two years ago. We know where some of these features are. And what we've done, what we do today is in our excavations, we're actually recording all the field data on tablets in GIS. So all this is literally in real time. So when you look at this map right here, for example, this feature right here that we believe is a um, is a is a uh, a subfloor pit that was under potentially a uh, um, some kind of cabin, potentially a slave quarter, is this pit that's right here. But you know, right now it's all an open field, and there, you know, until we do reconstructions on here, you know, this is this is what you learn as an archaeologist working at a historic house when you're at the site, when you're at your archaeology site. Everybody sees it as an archaeology site. The minute you backfill it, it becomes a grassy area, which means when the maintenance crew needs to come in and take down a tree, they're like, hey, we don't want to have to weed eat around this stump. We want to take the backhoe out and dig the stump out. And then, you know, if I'm not there in time, you know, hearing diesel engines, there's this massive hole ripped in the site. But when the, the uh, chief of maintenance has a GIS map on his phone, oh wait, it's in my pocket, when it, he has a phone and he can go onto the map and zoom in and see, oh my God, this tree is right here and I, we're going to have, you know, I'm going to be in Hades Path when Matt comes out here and we've got a backhoe here. You know, this, this is making the invisible visible. And while it's not making the visible 
invisible visible to visitors. It's making these sites that are invisible visible for preservation's sake. And this goes beyond, you know, the archaeology. Another, another area that you'd think would be pretty safe is up here at the main house where we've done all this restoration work. And about two years ago, we received a, uh, a grant from the Institute for uh, Museum and Library uh, Services to build a, uh, to incorporate an existing model that had been created by none other, none other than IATH, Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities here at UVA, some 10 years ago. This is a model that had built, been built by IATH. It was in 3DS Max, and it is this exquisite model that, um, that uh, uh, was developed by staff there. When you zoom into the model in 3DS Max, it is literally of cinemagraphic quality. You can go into the mullions and see each individual line of each mullion. But when you try to run this on a standard computer or do, you know, put uh, uh, textures onto these complex polygons, you know, I remember, you know, calling folks at IF and asking for, instead of a view like this, having a view like this, and they would start getting these nasty messages saying, do you know how long these renderings take, Matt? And I was like, oh, God, so I'll just ask for one and I'll be happy with it. Well, what, what, we, what we received with this grant was the... Um, we wanted to look in to how to simplify the model and be able to bring it into a GIS environment because by, by the time three years ago, what uh, Esri has been doing is anything that you can bring into GIS, you can put online. Once it's online, anybody can access it. Like I, like I stated, this is not a model that's on the hard drive here. This is on the World Wide Web. And what the... the um, we worked with the, uh, uh, the Center for Advanced Spatial Technology at the University of Arkansas. They built a much simplified model of, the, of this main house that when you click on individual elements, such as the window, um, what it allows you to do is associate records with it. And part of this IMLS grant is taking um, Tessa, how many, and we have Tessa Honeycutt in the room here. Tessa's uh, part of the staff at Montpelier. She's been incorporating all the data from the, from the restoration of the main house. And oh my goodness, I forgot. Yeah, well, there was a restoration of the main house that happened. So back in 2001, we tagged another family, the, 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 uh, the Mellon family, to get $25 million to rip off the DuPont wings. Yes, it was a little bizarre. And the Mellon, Mellon family paid for the removal of the DuPont's additions on the Montpelier main house. Fortunately, as part of that, that was, you all might remember this, this was a very controversial uh, project because we were removing basically in some parts a 150-year-old a, a structure from a 200-year-old structure. And so what we, what we devised in this restoration process was this extreme level of documentation, and we needed to do this for two reasons. One was with the restoration of the house, there were no records of what trim was in various parts of the house. So when you, you know, when we started taking off the wings, what the architectural historians discovered is the windows that were in the back of the house in the Madison era got moved to these DuPont, the back of the DuPont wings in 1901, 1902. So literally about 90% of the house was still within the shell of this, these DuPont additions. So is this incredible jigsaw puzzle of taking the house apart and then putting it back together again. And this was right at the advent where CAD was, um, was, be, was in, win, in a Windows-based software. Thank goodness we had digital photography. And so what Tessa has been doing is going through how many photos have you processed over the past two years? 100,000 photos going in and tagging them all and writing up a description for them so that these can be integrated into this model. And so when you look at these layers here, the, the one thing that is unfortunate about GIS, I mean, it's not unfortunate because as archaeologists, we love it. It's a landscape-based software. So it, it doesn't have the kind of walk-through um, features like Unity used to have. It's all, you know, like you're a bird flying over the landscape. So how we decided to organize the model was in layers. So in order to look into the main house, if you try to go in this, it is an absolute nightmare. So what you got to do is do what architectural historians do not like, you rip the roof off. But we can do it because it's all virtual, so it's all safe. And then when you look at this, 
you've the all the interiors are modeled here so you can you know tessa has found all the photos that are associated with this hearth right here in the upstairs the pre-restoration image the restoration images and is organized and tessa is in the middle of this i mean she is literally you know at the computer, you know, uh, associating all these files right now. So these will all be uh, complete. When do you think this will all be complete, Tessa? Not to put you on, no pressure here. In the next couple of months. In the next couple of months, exactly. So, so, but every single, you know, door, every wall has, a, has an identifier that Tessa is, you know, uh, ascribed in an attribute table in the model itself. Uh, if you go to, if you take off the, uh, the the second floor, as you might expect, the first floor is there with the drawing room. Uh, you can look at everything from you know the pedimented um, uh, doorway right here, which is one has had the most you know amazing uh, uh, records. But basically, what this what what Tess is doing and what we're doing with this project is using the model as a filing system for all these records. So not only is there you know, these interesting photos that could be used for uh, uh, virtual exhibits, but also for anyone maintaining the house, they'll know which elements of these have original Madison fabric and which are reconstructed, which makes a difference in how we preserve different parts of the house. And you know, what, what, we, what, what we might be tempted or need to, to um, if we're needed to do any kind of rectification, choosing what fabric to, uh, to uh, sacrifice. And part of the restoration also included a whole lot of archaeology. Part of the restoration, you know, we opened up some uh, uh, 1,200 units, not only in the cellars, but under the portico, in the back lawn for the bunker that was in this area, and the excavations for the front lawn as well to, for discovering this front entrance way. And so for part of this uh, project, what we've been doing is um, digitizing all of the archaeological features, and uh, when you so in this model, what you can do is you can click on, for example, this storage pit that's in the basement, and then toggle through all of the the drawings, the plan views, the profiles of each each of the features that are in this area. And in doing this, one thing that we um, relied on, you know, with the amount of data that we had was a volunteer base. We have these expedition programs where people come for, the, for a week and do archaeology with us, and we wanted to find some way to involve the citizen science process in the digitization of all these records. Because when you look at how many records are here, this is a map showing all the units that have been excavated. You know, like Will was talking about every year, you know, especially when we had the, when we had the uh, Rubenstein money, we're able to open up a lot of units. So what's in green is what we've digitized and is online. What is a blank area, as you might guess, is not online. We're, we're beginning to get some of these records in, but we don't have all, all the records in uh, uh, yet. Um, but in the green areas, for example, what volunteers have been doing is, uh, for example, in this unit right here, let's see, um, I need stratum B here. Yeah, stratum B, what we've got is a link that goes to... Um, all of the records that are associated with this particular unit. What we do with the with the um, with these records is we've got them temporarily stored in uh, in uh, the Google Drive. What volunteers go in do and do is relabel these based on the unit and the strata and what the type of the record it is. Once they've relabeled all these photos, then they go and digitize all of this information into the record right here that you can see that has the soil colors and everything else. And so basically, you know, in the areas of the house, this, you know, we're, we're probably never going to return to this data. But what, because we've got, you know, the, all this area has been restored. But what is, you know, the problem, just like there was with the, um, the, the, the built, with, the, with, with the, uh, all the records that are associated with the main house, is there's just an incredible number of records that are invisible and not accessible and are at risk. All these records up until about two years ago were in the archeology span building, which is a building from 1908 that's wooden, got a bunch of paper records in a wooden building with no sprinkler system. If the building burned down, we would lose all the records associated with the context with thousands of artifacts. And then when you look at you know, what we do as an organization, where we're constantly going back and wanting to reinterpret these artifacts you know, based on the kind of interpreter programs that we do, working with the descendant community, this, this data 
is the legacy of the ancestors, of the enslaved people who lived and worked at Montpelier. This is their material record of their lives. And for descendants, this is an incredibly important record. And by making it present in the, in the, uh, in the GIS and online, it makes it accessible. And so what this, what we, um, what we're, what we're looking at with, um, with all this is, uh, really, you know, what, what we, you know, when you get beyond the main house, when you get beyond areas that have been reconstructed and you get into areas where you've got, uh, buildings that are in place, what you begin to see is, is that in some cases like the South yard, this has all been reconstructed. But when you go to areas such as the home farm, where we've done archaeology in spaces and these sites have not been reconstructed, we don't have a representation of this building. But what, um, what uh, uh, Tessa has been doing in her spare time is finding a way to really produce these buildings in a GIS environment. And so this is kind of a, this is a proof of concept that Tessa developed for the South Yard where she took photos that uh, she took of these buildings, the reconstructed buildings in the South Yard in um, SketchUp built a, a simple model, uh, you know, an outline of the, the buildings, the exterior of the buildings, and then applied the photos, the rectified photos as textures to the buildings. And so all of a sudden, you know, we don't necessarily need these for the South Yard because these are reconstructed, but in the 3D image, we have these represented at this point. But we, and when you start looking at other areas though where we've not reconstructed, all of a sudden, and obviously we've not done this yet, otherwise this would be in this map, is, so Tessa, you're going to be very busy with all this, um, is we want to start doing reconstructions of these other buildings and representing them on the landscape. So that, in many ways, is going to be able to make these sites visible, again, in a 3D environment. And there's, you know, the applications on this, you know, are the, the imagination is just our limitation. But there are other, there's other parts of the property, though, where instead of getting into interpretation of sites, we need to look at the preservation of sites. And you can imagine the Montpelier property with 2,650 acres, we've got over 100 buildings. Most of these buildings were built before 1908. And when you start looking at these structures, they're in really bad shape. The Montpelier Foundation, we, what we need to do is start, we don't, we'd have no documentation for these buildings. The, the one thing that we do have in terms of, of documentation is uh, photographs that we've taken and, you know, assessing current conditions up until the point where we started putting this into GIS became a little difficult. So this is a picture of the stud barn, which is built in uh, around 1902. Um, here's the condition of it about three years ago. Well, with GIS, what you can do is you can, you know, if you see changes, like I literally took this picture this morning and entered this record on my phone, you know, at, at seven o'clock in the morning, this roof after the hurricane began to sag. So you can enter this information in. That's fine and good for assessing conditions, but for really making this building something that is real and can be seen by various constituencies, building 3D renderings of these allows all kinds of information to begin to be attached to it. So one, one project we're looking to begin working with the MDC and a, and a, and a graduate student and, and Tessa is beginning to, to really, is to begin to record the buildings that are at risk. For example, there's a, on the, um, on the, on the western part of the property, here's the main house. This is Jackson Town Road where there's a, uh, oh, there's a well-established uh, Freeman's community that, where descendants are still living there today. There's a house called the Page House. And this house hasn't been occupied for about 10 years. And one of the problems with a lot of the houses at Montpelier is that after the internet came, nobody wanted to live at Montpelier because there's no internet access, because there's no cable in the area. So with buildings no longer being occupied, no one there to, to tell if there's a leak happening in the house, buildings degrade quite quickly. And so to, to begin to build 3D representations of these literally will make these structures that are no longer seen be seen and be present. And what our challenge is, is to find a way to make these kind of renderings accessible and relevant to the public. And one way, one group these are relevant are to descendants of DuPont workers. In fact, the Page family is, uh, the, this was a, a family, the Page family lived in, in this house from 1925 up until 1975. 
and last spring brought descendants out to visit the house and the family has roots in Orange County. They have roots that more than likely go back to the enslaved communities that are at the plantations in this area. So what we have in these houses is really almost in many ways is a continuous occupation by some families from the period of enslavement into the 20th century. And so you've got, you know, land use traditions that are here that, you know, by starting to represent these structures in a 3D environment, you know, this is where um, all kinds of things become become available. And with, with that, one thing that, you know, that we kind of suffer from with, with these maps is the complexity of the maps. Having someone, you know, throwing this as a, as a U, UT or a, um, H, a, a, a link for somebody to explore, you're going to get lost. But one thing that many of, how many of y'all have heard of story maps with the GIS? A few of y'all have, and what what are story maps? I'm gonna get a drink here. I've been uh, thank you for bearing with me. This is the first time I've done a web based map based lecture, and usually it's smoother with a PowerPoint. But what story? Everybody, anyone know what story maps is? I saw a few people raise their hand. I know what it is, but I, somebody else should speak other than me. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's kind of the gateway drug to GIS for the non-user. So that, that, that's a beautiful description of it. I love that because I, I, would, I don't know what how I'd describe it, but this um, th what you stated is exactly what GIS allows to, you to do. So, for example, this is a uh, this is a story map talking about how to use this GIS model. And instead of just throwing somebody at the model, it's essentially what you said. It's a step-by-step -step guide on how to go through the various uh, floors of the main house that you can click on various elements and then see, you know, this, this built environment as it, as it was in the 1820s and then also understand how we got there with the restoration. And kind of the goal with this is to get people to go from this to actually exploring these maps and then really begin to understand, you know, what the discipline of, for example, archaeology and historic preservation is all about. You know, preserving this information is important, not just for places like Montpelier. You know, we're not just at risk of losing sites at Montpelier. When you look at Montpelier in relationship to the region, you know, you've got, here's uh, Monticello here, here's Highland, Barbersville. This is the Southwest Mountain Chain. There's a whole line of these, of these communities that were there during the period of enslavement where there are buildings dating to the 18th to the 19th century that are in various states of repair and using a, 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 a place like Montpelier to show why this preservation is important and why this data matters allows you know people to begin to understand how this can be done in a whole lot of other areas and this really gets into you know what the goals of the Montpelier descendant community are the Montpelier descendant community is made up of descendants of not just Montpelier but the the, the enslaved community at Montpelier was related to all these communities in the you know before sale in 1844 but um, uh, connected to you know all areas all across the region and the information that's at these other sites is in many ways just as important as, as what we're preserving at Montpelier for understanding what's happening at Montpelier. And so, you know, the, the, the really, um, one of the key things that I think is, for me, is so exciting about GIS is that once you have some of these uh, toolkits established, with a phone, you can go out and take photographs of a structure, outline it on a map, and it'll be in a GIS record that anybody can access. I mean, there's obviously privacy concerns with this and the need to get permission from uh, from property owners. But all of a sudden, and this is one thing, you know, with the, with the citizen science approach that we do where people come out and spend a week during archaeology, 
one of the things that uh, Tessa is setting up in the spring is a citizen science uh, program where people come out and do recordings of the buildings that are on the property, learn how to do photo documentation, and then turn these into 3D models that can be put on, on, the, uh, on these maps. And so this isn't you know, something that we're doing just at Fort Montpelier. This enables the, the, the public to begin doing this on their own property on their own in their own communities i mean this is where you know for us as 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 academics as as professionals in a community this is how we can make our discipline relevant to the larger world and this is where you know with the data part of this making the invisible visible you know it's more than just making it accessible and safeguarding it it's how to make that data once it's accessible relevant to different constituencies and for us you know everybody in this room that's the easy constituency to get to that's you know whether you're doing it for a course that you're taking or this is your discipline that you're in you're going to be interested in this but how do you take someone that is you know they don't, you know, like what the National Trust always says, you know, there's some 5 million preservationists out there in the U.S. who own older houses or have access to older houses. They just don't know it. How to turn them into preservationists that can record this kind of data and then make it accessible. I mean, once that starts to happen, and this is where what drives me crazy in the archaeology community is hearing, you know, fellow archaeologists decry how the public doesn't care about archaeology. Well, you know who's responsible for that? It's us as archaeologists. If we don't make it relevant, why should anyone care? If we write academic articles that only answer questions that we're interested in as a community, that doesn't make it justifiable for the expenditure of what we're doing with these kind of sites. We've got to, by, by making the meta part of this uh, crowdsourced, by getting people to begin to record the data that we're interested in, all of a sudden there's going to be new applications that we've never even thought of. So this is where, for me, what is most exciting about GIS. I mean, sure, uh, you know, I can, I can geek, geek out some hard time on, on 3D models and being able to see this stuff visually represented on the web and be able to share it. But to get, use this to be able to inst inspire people to ask questions about their own heritage, I mean, that's absolutely mind-blowing. And, and it makes it so that, you know, we start to serve not our own needs, but ha a broader set of constituents' needs. And that, that's, where, that's where the future, I feel, lies with, with all this. And what I'd love to hear is, you know, one thing where, where we're, we have a big disconnect with all this is uh, making the, this data relevant. And, you know, what sort of platforms you all have seen where this could be used? You know, is it for visitors when they're out in front of the house and they see a post hole and with their phone what pops up is a little bling and it says, you know, you can see what this post hole looked like? Is it, you know, and, and that would be done maybe through um, Google Maps, you know, because you can export a KMZ to, to Google Maps. Is it, you know, I don't know. I mean, and that's where... That's where I hit the wall, and that's where my limitations and my training as an archaeologist and not as, say, a communicator, <laughs> you know, that's where I think that the next, you know, but before we get beyond this kind of technology, we've got to get to the relevance, and, and you know, that's what I think is going to push us to the next level, so, but... Thank you all for listening to this. Rather, it, I, it's, my God, it's 5.57. <laughs> this ramble. I, was, I said, I'll be a half an hour and leave time for questions. So I apologize. So, But thank you all. And I hope there's time for questions if anyone does have questions. Or maybe I exhausted you all. So... <laughs> Making sure the maintenance guy didn't ground up your stump, and then before jumping into the house stuff, you said there was a problem at the house that needed to be figured out. You didn't get back to it. I'm trying to remember what that was, Tom. Well, maybe not a problem. But okay. Thank you very much for this. This is great. Um, and the Peter Asselstad also did a lot of rectified drawings. I guess you have those. Yeah, yeah, Tessa's been using those. The photographs that he did were absolutely essential for the pre-restoration um, imagery. Yeah. So, no, anyway, but if you can remember what the problem was, I guess they were drilling out of Madison 
piece of the house or something. So. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Tom. I can't remember what that was. No so. problem. Yeah, the other thing that brings up what Tom is, and Tom worked at Montpelier for some 20 years, is institutional knowledge. I've been joking with, with staff that I'm trying to put my mind into GIS, so if I win the lottery, it's all still here. So, <laughs> Or get hit by a meteor, whichever hits comes first. So, so uh, I'm an archaeologist at uh, Monticello, um, and I had some questions on sort of uh, differences in archaeology there. You guys were talking, you were talking earlier in the program about using metal detector survey. Have you guys done any systematic shovel testing? And if not, are you considering doing that in the future? Oh, yeah, we have done uh, any project that we do. Shovel test pit survey is an absolute must in terms of locating features. And uh, also, whenever there's any kind of clearance work needed for locating Native American sites. Okay. But in terms of locating what, you know, the, the Montpelier descendant community calls these sites of labor, these, these sites of memory, metal detector survey is absolutely the most efficient way for finding barns, fences, roads. I mean, th there are more than likely going to be missed by shovel test pits. Yeah. And shovel test pits are little round holes that archaeologists dig that are about a foot in diameter. Usually they're every 25 feet. And we're de when you're dealing with a structure that could be as small as 12 feet by 15 feet with a very small scatter, more than likely that shovel test pit just, we've done this where we've shovel test pitted areas that we've metal detected, you find one nail and that's enough to write the site off. But then you do a metal detector survey mm -hmm. and there's about 400 nails. So yeah. it's, uh, so metal detector surveys of why, we rely on those for the phase one for historic sites for just assessing mm -hmm. the historic landscape. Cool, and just one other quick thing. Do you guys also have this data in DAX? Uh, we do not have it in uh, in DAX. We we have selective data in DAX that has been uh, cataloged, but for the um, like the survey data, uh, we we don't. No. Sorry, any soil composition tests in addition to the features to determine. What, um, what the structures might have been used for? Yeah, so we do soil chemistry testing. Like, we, like when we do our shovel test pit surveys, we'll take a soil chemistry test at the bottom of each STP and then use that to, f you know, find areas that, you know, don't, sh don't have an artifact signature but have a chemical signature. And then we also do soil composition in terms of the amount of grit or gravel that's in soil, because that can tell us the uh, geologic horizon, the kind of erosion that's happened, and then also the presence of yard surfaces, because where you, get, where you have a swept yard, you tend to get an armored surface, and there's more gravels present. So, yeah, do a lot with soils. <laughs> Hi. Um this was really awesome, thank you. Um, a couple of, I guess, more comments than questions, but inviting you to maybe speak more on the, the topics. But I thought it was really interesting thinking about kind of the concept, and zooming out and thinking more disciplinary-wise, hmm. um, and thinking about the concept of legacy data and the notion that, I mean, I think maybe the traditional experience in archeology span as well as maybe architectural preservation, a few other things that I'm not perhaps as, much, as involved in as archeology, span but um, the notion that rather than having data that's not on platforms that's easily indexed and searchable and, and um, cross-referenced, instead, in fact, the data, is, the data itself is the thing that's lost and not accessible, and you're using the archaeology to create new data that speaks to the legacy? Yeah, and that, the, the legacy of the data in terms of um, archaeology is essentially a destructive science. And with excavations, you know, once you excavate a feature out of the ground, you can never put it back in the ground. So that's why we're, you know, do all kinds of recording of provenance of the artifacts, of doing the soil chemistry, of photographing all the steps. And since all this is, uh, um, you know, grid-based mapping, it's just highly, this is all highly achievable using GIS because, you know, the state grid plane is what we excavate on 
and by being able to have all these um, uh, units. I mean, we basically, we've basically been basically GIS ready. Any archaeologist is GIS ready because everything is placed on a grid. And then that grid can be placed into a GIS map quite easily. And with today's technology, like I said, about three years ago, we started doing all this in the field, recording in the field, so we don't have any legacy, backlog of legacy data. But um, what we're working on right now is taking the last you know, 20 years of data that wasn't done in GIS, was recorded on paper, and then transposing that into GIS in a way so that analysis can happen and you get these unique and, and very um, dynamic models of you know, features and records that can be analyzed and really not only analyzed for, you know, for example, by other archeologists and making it accessible for other folks who wanna do similar studies, but also making it accessible to the public. Is, and that's where a lot of what we've focused on in terms of the front end is searching for ways to take, you know, for example, areas like the South Yard where, you know, we've re rebuilt this area, but we have all these features that were present, is how to make this into something that's exciting for, you know, either a visitor or someone who's interested in, you know, the history of, of the region. Because like I said, when that we, we accomplish that, what that means is you got another person who's interested in, sees the value in preserving archeology. span And that isn't just preserving legacy data, it means preserving sites that you know, no one even knows is an archeology span site. You know, whenever you, know, you, you go to a, um, a, a present day uh, house site that dates to the 1820s, and had over, say, 300 acres in Virginia, you know there is an enslaved community that was there. And there, there's housing that more likely is gone. It's more than likely present in the archaeological record. But if people, the more people that know that, the more of a chance those sites are going to be preserved. And more than likely, it's going to be a situation like at Montpelier, where the only record of the actions of those enslaved community members is in the archaeology. There's not going to be documents for that. There's probably not going to be surviving oral history. Or by doing the archaeology, you, you're able to engage descendants and see the value in, you know, what this has to offer their families. And I think, you know, for us, one of the most exciting constituencies that we've engaged with is descendants because they get it. When they see, when they're holding an artifact and the last person that touched that artifact that they just found was either their ancestor or someone that knew their ancestor, and they have no family heirlooms that have been transferred down through the years. I mean, that, for many people, that's a spiritual journey. And to use the GIS to preserve that information and then engage people is, you know, that's, that's, that's the next level of what we're trying to do is, is, you know, how to get this out of, you know, kind of our, you know, very subjective interests to ones that should have relevance to um, to the, the folks that are connected to it, and one, ones that have the, where it makes the most difference to you know if if we rewrite interpretations, say in the South Yard. I mean, today if we write interpretations of the South Yard, and unbeknownst to us, with our academic background, they have a racist uh, slant because we live in a racist society, and the ideas that we produce, if we don't look, think critically, they're going to be racist. The MDC, the Montpelier Descendant Committee, will let us know about that because they, they've seen the value of the archaeology. Getting this, you know, what we have an obligation to do as social scientists is to make sure that, you know, if, there, if there's a chance of this being connected to people who are alive today, we have an obligation to make sure that we're doing outreach to them. And one way to do this is, you know, what we found is digitally because everybody's connected you can do a zoom meeting you can give access to this kind of maps before you know it was a um it was a, what we might be able to do is send a um uh let me see uh, there's a a layer on here that has all the reports archaeological project area surveys yeah so this one right here if you click on any of these, what you'll get is a, um, uh, let's see, 
Right, smokehouses. Yeah, you'll get a 300-page report, archaeology report, or I'm sorry, 210 pages that usually, you know, unless it's written in a way that's approachable by the public, is not going to interest anybody. But having, you know, having created, being able to create story maps on these, you know, that are quick, you can go through and see, you know, hit main points, see main features that have happened. There, it's, a, it's a much more dynamic, dynamic way to engage with, with folks. And uh, so it's just, you know, getting to that. We're finding that, um, that, finding that, that juncture between, you know, how and why we're, we're, we are digitizing this legacy data and the outreach to make it relevant to uh, different groups. So, I mean, I guess I would only follow up and ask more specifically, um, what is Montpelier as kind of an entity doing, I guess, partnership-wise and or outreach-wise to kind of disseminate some of these, uh, some of this content, if you will, to um, various kind of mainstream platforms? Because I guess that would be my next thing is because we're here looking at a presentation that's hosted on ArcGIS Online. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, the average person, the, the most engagement they'd have with a GIS system is probably Google Maps or Google Earth um, yeah. or something, I guess, GIS related. Um, so is there any, I guess, thinking about partnering one way or another? And then also just kind of the narrative content and thinking about mainstream news platforms and things like that to kind of highlight some of that narrative and content as it evolves through the work that you guys are doing. That, that is an area where we have not succeeded yet. I mean, that, that's an area where we have a lot more work to do. And, and that's where um, the, the, one, the one way we begin to approach this is by engaging constituent groups that we're close with. So like the Montpelier Descendant Committee, we're um, working with the Descendant Committee on, on grants that we're, we're developing for similar projects like on the, on the South Yard. And using those partnerships to figure out what interests and needs the d descendants have. Now, for going mainstream on this, this is where we need somebody with a heck of a lot more imagination than, than I do, for example. You know, th this is where, you know, what, how, to make, how, to, how to make this, you know, uh, compelling to the point of hitting, you know, thousands upon thousands of people. You know, we have not gotten there yet. And that's where, you know, I, I think that's where our biggest deficiency is is how to make this stuff relevant. And, you know, we make this relevant with, ex you know, folks that are, are in, our, in our family, so to speak. Like, we have about 1,200 people that have come on expeditions over the past decade, and they're, they're probably the main users of this. There are a lot of the, the folks that volunteer and do the data entry. But, um, you know, one, one thing that we want to, we're, we're trying to break into is into the Esri Conference and starting to talk with people there for the, 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 like the scene, arc scene developers, to see what other examples have been, are out there for what we're looking at. And one area, I mean, Will, you can give testimony to this, is that in Europe, you know, these kind of, this kind of 3D modeling is huge because the, the, the heritage of archaeology in Europe isn't in the subfield of anthropology, it's in the field of history. It is, you know, nationally identified as being the heritage of, you know, various countries. Whereas here, archaeology has always been put in the field of anthropology, which is the study of the other. And you look at some of the most well-studied sites by historical archaeologists, they're black American sites that are studied by white archaeologists. And there's been a, um, kind of a myopia in terms of what questions have been asked. So I don't think archaeology is necessarily able to do this on its own. It's partnering with other disciplines to really be able to expand what we've got and make something like this into something that could be interesting to a lot more people. And when we do that, then we're going to be able to have preservation. But until we do that, it's going to be a long, hard row of trying to get people to understand why we should care about a site that when you look at you know, the archaeology of it, and what archaeologists are getting excited about, you see something like this, which is, oh, wrong one. 
and you have to put up with stuff like that. It's three bricks in a row. You know, that, that oh my God, mind-blowing, three bricks in a row. The only place you three, see three bricks in a row like this is where you've got a structure that has a masonry foundation. The only kind of structures that have a masonry foundation at Montpelier are the main house and the south yard. This one happens to be the blacksmith shop where there is a forge. And so this is a, a spot where there's some a lot of investment happening in terms of the uh, the owners here. So again, that's you know, getting folks excited about three bricks in a row. That's where we need to go. So, <laughs> yeah. What happened? How did it get there? Given the fact that today is Indigenous Peoples Day, I'm wondering if you could let us know if the lidar documentation of the landscape revealed any pre-contact uh, occupation patterns of the land. Uh, we hear mm. so frequently about uh, uh, physical archaeological artifacts that mm -hmm. uh, are, it, it occurs to me that you could begin to pair those two bodies of data. And then, and I'm, and I'm actually wondering if representatives from the Monica Nation have been on the land, and I'm sure they have, and sort of started to engage with you about uh, some of that storytelling. Yeah, I, if you had asked me this question about three years ago, Lewis, I would say, you know, Montpelier was it was an area in prehistoric times that was a hinterland. It was used for hunting. We have evidence of a small, uh, semi-permanent village at Montpelier, and so I wouldn't expect to find anything like this. But the experience that you know, engaging with the descendant community and hearing the kind of questions that they've put to the archaeology makes me want to do exactly what you just said. And we have not done this yet. We're, we're, we're beginning to do this at the insistence of the MDC, is engage the, the Monica Nation, because uh, they are representatives of the Manahoac, and put that question to them, and then have us not be the ones that are saying, oh, let me tell you about your heritage and how we'll find it. Be like, hey, you know, what would you want to know about your heritage, and what would you expect to see if we we're looking for it in the archaeology? Then I think... I could, I'd be better able to answer that question. And being, you know, uh, uh, the day that today is, it's an important one to ask. Yeah, I was uh, really struck with uh, your the sort of careful analysis and the data that's coming from the LIDAR layer. And it occurs to me if there's any uh, clearly man-made features, such human-made features that uh, don't make sense relative to the 18th and 19th century occupation, it could be that those are just data points that could be shared to say, hey, we've observed this. Absolutely. And, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, that's where, you know, more constituent groups, engaging more constituent groups is so important. And thanks for all your work. Oh, really, really well, thank great. you. Appreciate it. It's, uh, um, it's been an honor to do all this. So, yes. I have more of a question comment. Um, have you all looked at potentially, because um, the with ArcGIS, it's looking at it more of a bird's eye. It's kind of what you said at the beginning. Um, have you all looked at like VR technologies? Because the, the, to create the, the bird's eye, the, the, mm -hmm. the 3D program is already there. Have you all looked at like potentially like Prospect or like HoloLens or VR technologies that allow for that broader engagement? That's more of my question is the next step of engagement. Because like when you click onto one of these bubbles, it gives you images. But mm -hmm. what if there's a link to like a prospect, like OBJ file that allows you into the main mass building um, of that next thing? Have, is that been explored? I don't know if that's a no. I'm with question. you. I, I we have not explored that, and that that is something that um, you know probably I would imagine with that this the the site that's ready for that is the main house that IF built through 3ds Max because in that the the um, what we've been looking at right now is ways. To, and you might be able to answer this, and I'd appreciate it, is ways to get these 3D representations online and accessible. One, so that staff can access it, and then also so that we can begin to build models in-house of you know, these different uh, buildings that are out here and not have them you know, look something like um, you know, this, a little cube on the ground. And so, but having, doing the VR would be something that... Um, you know, is uh, I, 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 I don't know how to answer that because I, I would say, you know, 
it's kind of like when you, I've worked with cinematographers, cinematographers before. And if you're making a, a short video about something and you don't know what audience you're going to engage, it often becomes really problematic in terms of setting the script and writing out, you know, what, what that, um, what that script line is going to be. And so if there was a, if there was a particular, this is why I, I think that pairing what we're doing with constituencies and meeting the needs of those constituencies, I think it's going to be more likely to guarantee a success. So I'd want to know like who uses VR and what kind of platforms do they use? Do they use it in a setting at home with, you know, the, like you're saying, the, the, the lenses and that sort of thing? What, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, media are they looking to play? Is it a game? Is it an exploration game? Is it a shoot 'em up game? You know, what is it? And how, how to make what we're doing relevant and interesting to that group. And so that's where, like I said, we're not there. We're just, we're, be, we're getting this, making it accessible but we have not made it relevant yet outside of a very tight group. And that's where we need to do a lot more work. Thank you. That, yeah, well, these kind of questions help. So thank you. That's, that's really, that's huge. So. Well, given the time, shall we all join Matt at our reception down the hall? And thank you for Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And if anybody's interested in diving into any of these maps, I can send you enough story maps and links to these web maps where you can, if you have pr trouble sleeping at night, there'll be all sorts of things you can look at. So my email is mreeves at montpelier.org. So cool. Thank you.